Good morning. Happy Friday to everybody. I hope you've had a great week so far. I hope you've got a good weekend ahead of you. Um, it is uh, a cracker. It's going to be a cracker here in Sydney. 36 degrees, which I'm happy to announce. Well, not happy to announce, but we picked a good time to, to hire an Airbnb with a, with, a, with a pool, I think. And there's a long story behind that, but I won't go near it. Um, hopefully, for those of you down in Melbourne, you're going to enjoy uh, a good grand final day with your four-day weekend, which is both impressive and seemingly rather unfair. But uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It's been maybe quite a few years coming, I'd say. But um, before we kick off, thank you very much, Margaret, for jumping in. Now, I'd really love to know. Today, we're going to be talking about a few different things. But before I jump in and give you a bit of the background, I would like to know the specifics of what drew you to this. What was it about this particular webinar or the title or the guest that kind of drew you in? Lisa, I'd love to hear from you. Martin, mate, I'd always love to hear from you. Uh, Margaret, always interested in new ways of doing things. And I reckon uh, Sam is not only good at doing things new ways, but he's also very good at doing things in, in ways that kind of um, tend to work. I'd love to hear from you, Lisa and Martin. Uh, presumably your arms are working and everything, but yeah, let me know what, what, what specifically drew you to this particular session today, if you can, just on the chat box. would love to hear from you, if you can. If not, in the meantime, let me give you a bit of background. Um, Greg, there you go. Uh, this, I first met Sam, I think it was about maybe three or four years ago. And um, I just, I, th I kind of felt we really headed off straight away. And um, I had the opportunity to work with him within his business and get to know him sort of on a personal level. And there is so much to tell in terms of where the business uh, Taylor Wealth has been on, the journey it's been on. But in particular, I wanted to dive into kind of the systems and processes because Taylor is, is what I would say a business that is deliberately built a certain way with a focus on not necessarily getting really, really big or not necessarily, you know, having multiple advisors, but being very, very good at certain things and systematizing really well in there uh, whilst giving really, really valuable advice, which I think for a lot of businesses out there, that's a key thing. But I think what's interesting as well and where I want to get to is how they transition to that kind of business and also what I, what I, what I playfully term small giants, which is this growing uh, trend within the industry to move away from a traditional licensee model where it's, you know, big and everything, everybody sort of, uh, everybody sort of weighs down to the, to the greater good, to businesses that are coming together based on a, a combination of values and working together with the aim of much like this business, kind of just doing things really, really well and creating value as a group uh, rather than trying to get big. And I want to sort of talk about how that works for Sam, particularly because it's that it's an interesting blend between being, you know, part of a licensee versus the other extreme is self-licensed. I think this is a really interesting spot. So along the way, I'm going to draw upon you. If there's any questions that you have along uh, about anything, please feel free. Lisa wants to hear Sam present. Who, why wouldn't you? Uh, Martin, trying to go on a cement. Really good to see you, Martin. I'll come back to you, by the way. Uh, trying to go on a similar journey with success and furious and struggling in the other. But, mate, bring any questions you, you, you want to the fore. And if there's something specific that you'd like to sort of, you know, verbally give just give me a shout and greg welcome as well long time no see anyway let's get this show on the road without any further delay sam are you there g'day Stu. mate how are you very well thank you how are you i'm very good are oh, you in the new place which is lovely yeah in the new place and about to head down to watch the afl i believe yes i'm, go I'm getting as close as right next door to the mcg as unfortunately i was unable to secure a ticket anyone online here that has any last minute hookups Definitely. Take anybody, one, but, uh, any, anybody has a ticket, please. Atmosphere. Um, yeah, how long have you been into AFL? Uh, well, it actually, funnily enough, much like uh, my business was actually done by as a result of my dad. So he's been a fanatical um, Collingwood fan, full disclosure, I'm a Collingwood fan, um, since, yeah, obviously since I, was, since I was born. So I think there was a short, brief period of trying to, I've never lived in Melbourne. Um, so I think there was a brief period of following the Swans before I was pretty heavily indoctrinated back towards the only team that is supportive in our household, which is Collingwood. So, uh, you, some some would say no, I'm not a massive AFL fan, but I know enough to be dangerous. You don't look like you're, you're everyday <laughs> Collingwood supporter. You must That's get that. Pretty much the first thing that everyone uh, that it, pretty much everyone says when they find out that I'm a Collingwood fan. So, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a. I think it's yeah. I, I, it's funny. I, I support. Um, obviously Premier League. I don't think we've got a Collingwood now. I don't think we've got a team that everybody hates. We tend to just hate the successful ones, which uh, obviously isn't Collingwood. No, bit of a dig there. Yeah. But, um, mate, let's dive into it because we've got a lot we could cover here. Sure. For those who don't know anything about you or Taylor Wells, can you give us a bit of a background? Like uh, what's the business all about? Who do you work with? 
Uh, what kind of advice do you give? Give us the background. Sure. Okay. So um, I guess, yeah, high, high level summary. So our business uh, <clears throat> is now Talon Wealth, used to be called WB Financial. Um, it was started by okay. my dad back in 1996. So we are now in our 27th year of operation. Um, yep. I have, I literally just ticked over 19 years last Friday working there. So that's pretty much. Congratulations. The, uh, that is yeah, only my second real career in my adult life. So, um, yeah, but our business is, I guess I would call it a typical financial planning business. Our sort of average client looks like a typical Australian sort of, you know, 10 years either side of retirement. Um, okay. The advice that we provide is largely holistic advice, so around superannuation, personal investment, insurance, um, with a big focus on strategy and cash flow modelling as opposed to necessarily just investment management. Okay. Um, we have about 165-ish um, ongoing service clients okay. and it's currently um, delivering service to that with four staff. Okay, that's that's actually a pretty low footprint for yeah. most businesses and I look at it. We'll maybe get into that a bit more. Yeah. Um, the cash flow thing, it's interesting. I've worked with some other WB uh, practices in, in the past and cash flow was always a big part of that model. Isn't that right? Yeah. Long before anybody else was doing it. Yeah, I think so. We've definitely... I think it's probably it's it's probably the hardest part of advice to deliver and something that we do less of these days than we ever have done before. But okay. the one thing that we have um, stuck with is the actual modeling in terms of like you know like the like for the technical I guess software being the X tools modeling to actually show yep. you know, wealth wealth projection and wealth accumulation and sort of year by year goals kind of thing, which we think is sort of the thing that the clients tend to value the most in the interactions okay. with us. And I think we can, I'd love to get into a bit more about the cash flow and the software and also the valuing. But can we go back to the very beginning? You mentioned two careers. What was the first one? I used to sell, I used to, my very first job out of high school, um, I used to uh, sell Mercedes Benz in Mossman. Oh, right. Down in, okay, cool. And um, how did you get into that? I I left, I actually had zero intention of ever being a financial advisor and ever right. working with my dad at all. Like if you asked me back in high school days what I thought of that, I would have told you that it sounds like, the most boring thing ever and the absolute worst idea. Um, okay. And 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 probably part of that was some, I'm sure there was some rebellion factors in, included in that. So when I finished high school, I was really into cars and decided that I wanted to, that selling them would be a pretty fun job, but I only wanted to sell prestige cars. So I basically walked into every um, prestige dealership on the North Shore and Northern Beaches and asked for a job. Um, and it just so happens the one 500 metres down the road from my house was the only one considering taking on sales cadets. Um, oh, wow. So yeah, started there as a trainee salesperson and then worked there for, for I think three and a half years in total. By the time I was 21, I'd driven basically every single Mercedes Benz for sale in Australia up to up to like a million dollar price. And what was your what's your favorite? Or what was your favorite? Probably SL65 AMG oh, yeah. by Turbo V12. You, you, I, I've, you cannot beat the way an MG sounds. It's just, it's a next level. I've never heard so many different cars. And every time I hear an MG, I go, you win. Yeah. Just, they're amazing. So obviously you, you sort of did that and um, had no intention of joining. How did, how did it come about that you just went from yeah. not going to do it to... So I, I, I did fairly well selling cars because I, I guess I was passionate about it. Um, but I pretty quickly... I guess calculated slash figured out that there's only so many cars a person can physically sell in a year. And that generally meant to do that, you had to work at least Saturday, if not Sunday as well. So I decided that that right. was probably a viable long term plan for my lifestyle um, desires and aspirations. So okay. um, at the time, I went to my dad and hit him up for a part time admin job so I could go back and finish the business degree that I had briefly started before that, that stint selling cars. Okay. Uh, and again, still with zero intention of, of working for him. And then I think that within six months of working there, I'd switched from full-time uni and part-time work to the to the other way around, full-time work and part-time uni. And then, yeah, that was 19 years ago now. And here, here we what, are. What, like, what changed? Like, to go from, I mean, you obviously, there's, I mean, you've been doing it for 19 years, so you must have found some element of that you actually yeah. enjoyed yeah, well, I think I think first and foremost, probably the fact that it wasn't from the inside, it wasn't quite as boring as it looked like from the outside, ultimately. Um, and yeah. just seeing, like, I remember the model of our business always for a long time was to have 
two, like we ran an advice pod. So there was always two advisors in every meeting. And so generally for me in the starting, in the st- starting period of that time, it was with my dad as the lead advisor. Yeah. Um, and so just seeing him <laughs> run those meetings and I guess, you know, answer these questions for clients and tell them, you know, that they could achieve the things that they wanted to when potentially they didn't think possible or didn't know how. And just seeing the, um, yeah, I guess the reactions of those people once they get that that clarity and and knowledge, it just uh, yeah, it became pretty pretty um, enjoyable and pretty exciting, and and you know something that you wanted to see more of, I guess ultimately. And then and yeah, and then I realised that I had a uh, a acumen slash desire interest in actually running a business as well as being a financial advisor necessarily, and so yeah, it all just sort of fell into place really. Okay. Can we just can I just ask about the pod system? Because it's funny, different people have got different views on how to structure um, you know, the working yeah. groups. And, and this is one that comes up time and time again where you have an advisor and associate advisor, and then essentially the associate advisor is going and, and dealing with the team in the back office. What's your yeah. take on that as a model? Um, my unfiltered take is yeah, that, unfiltered. that it's an incredibly unprofitable way to run a business. Okay. Yeah. So basically, I guess to put that in context, so when I, so I first bought into our business back in 2007 and complete and like just s- small increments initially and then towards the end of it accelerated that but, but fully bought my dad out in 2019. Um, so it started in 2007? Yeah. Wow, that's a long buyout. I know, yeah. Well, it's kind of like an, an, a... Um, uh, token bid in 2007 and then a little bit, you know, 2009, then bigger bits and bigger bits. And then I think in 2019, we finished it. The final purchase I made okay. for him was like 40% of the business, basically. So I'd been Got it. the owner for a little while. Um, and yeah, at that time, we had probably a similar number of clients, probably a little bit less revenue. And we had a headcount of 11, full time equivalent, probably, let's call it nine. Um, yep. And pretty much overnight, I restructured all of that and replaced four people with one person, um, did away with the pod system and just had a single single advisors managing their client books. And then over time, we sort of evolved that further. Um, but I, but to the point of the profitability, so when, when I bought my dad out, I think we were running at like 17 or 18% EBIT. Um, right. And today we run it, we'll probably... Probably hit 50 this year. Okay. So that's a really long 17, 80% EBIT, right? And now to 50. That, so that's a really long transition period, right? You've gone from 2007 when you started the buyout. So at that point, you obviously you made a decision you wanted the business you, or you wanted to own it. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And what along the way did you try and change which didn't get changed or you didn't quite get traction all the way to like how quick you, you – I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is – by the time you actually changed, you obviously had a clear idea of what you wanted to change, but that would have developed over time, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, funnily, well, not funnily enough, fr- maybe frustratingly enough, um, let's say from 2017 to 2000, and, sorry, 2007 to 2017, uh, not yeah. a lot really changed. Um, okay. Had maybe had some ideas, but but my dad was largely still the, the, the general manager, I guess, for want of a better term. Um, and also we at the time were licensed by a... Uh, dealer group owned by a financial institution, a, a bank. Yep. Um, so we were pretty, I guess, hamstrung in the things that we could do. Yep. Um, but yeah, I guess that I can, f- f- for the big changes really, like, so that change really happened in 2019. Um, and a couple of key things happened at that time. Firstly, I, I finished the buyout. Secondly, we left that dealer group and started our own license. And then yep. that coincided with being able to use offshore resources, which wasn't allowed at our previous license. And then I guess probably the other key piece to that, which was happening along the way, but has accelerated again since that time, is we have been uh, users of managed accounts for a very long time, since like 2011. Um, but again, in sort of 2018, 2017, 18, we probably had it of our, let's say at the time, 150 million of fun probably about 60 of it would have been on a managed account platform um, right. the rest all spread out across that whereas if we fast forward today of our 200 
mil procs of fun, about 180 of that sits on the same, on the one managed account platform. So that's interesting because I was at, when I was at MLC in the early 2000s, their proposition was obviously they would go in and they'd say, don't, don't just give us 10% of your book, give us all the book and we'll put it on the platform. And there was a really strong migration from having multiple mm-hmm. platforms to having a single platform. Whereas by the sounds of it, the journey that the business went on was exactly the opposite. Is that correct? Uh, no, I think it's ultimately, I think it was at the same. So we, so back, so back when in like say 2007, we probably supported yeah. four, four or five platforms. And then um, it went up and, and up. And now it's, it's basically one pretty much. Okay. So, but it went the other way and then came back. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so like, if you look back on the, the biggest learnings that you, or the biggest reasons that you kind of decided, you went from being a big team, 17% profit, and then just decided, okay, we're going to we're going to flip this around. We're going to have fewer employees. We're going to be go to fifty percent. What are the biggest learnings that you, or things that you did? Um, yeah, that so I think, to do that? yeah. So probably the the biggest thing is that you need to get really um, really critical about the stuff that I touch myself ultimately. Um, and, and having, like, at the end of the day, right now it stands, I'm the only advisor in our business, so I'm the only person that can sit in front of a client and give advice. So okay. ultimately, the way that we have gone about building the systems and processes in our business is that basically everything else should be done by someone else other than me. Okay. Is that the main thing? Um. I think it's, yeah, well, that's probably the overarching thing. And then underneath that comes off a whole bunch of things like, you know, the fact that we run a managed account in in risk profile, um, a weight, weighted SMAs that doesn't have a requirement for rebalancing is a pretty yeah. massive thing. So, like, in terms of advice documents in our business, we don't really do, like, we don't have almost any need for rebalance um, SOAs or ROAs. Um, I guess the offshoring thing is another, I guess, a, I view it as sort of a force multiplier, like it has, a, it has its pros and cons overall, but the reality is that you can, you know, you can basically get two people over there for the cost of one person over here, pr- rough, roughly speaking, um, yep. which, is a pretty, which is a pretty useful thing to be able to access. Yep. Um, and, and yeah, and I think probably, probably the final part to that is, is just around the people that you surround yourself with. So a lot of, um, I guess, you know, like working with you has, has been a massive um, benefit to our business in, in a lot of that work that we've done. And we sort of started that offshoring journey and business yeah. progress and journey together. Um, yep. And then aside from that, then my, my business partners in the license are basically our peer group now. So we catch up, you know, we are on the phone to each other sort of every other day whenever someone's got a, a problem or, a, or an issue they're trying to work through, having that having that team around you That's that group. see the dark before or, yeah, it's very helpful. I want to come back to this, uh, the, the peer group, but I want to, can I just unpack a couple of these? Because like some of these, you talk about them as if they happen very easily for you, but I know that <laughs> they're <right? laughs> <It's> not. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's, it's like, and, and the first one, the top, the headliner is get clear about what you as advisor do and touch. Yeah. And I know there's a lot, of, one of the quotes I love off the back of the Alan Smith thing I did, um, and he, we were talking about the evolution of his business and the fact he's not involved with advice. And he, one of the things he said that really struck home with me was, if you'd, uh, if you'd, if I'd gone back in time and told past me the things I wouldn't be doing as an advisor anymore, I would have laughed and said, that's my bread and butter. That's where it, where it came from. It's not easy mm-hmm. as an advisor to, to, to go, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that and extract yourself yeah. from it. Yeah. Like you, did you, did you get it right first time or no, did you have to go through and it? Even, right even, and even today, it's still not perfect. So, I guess, and also based because of the fact that coming up through our business, so I started basically in the filing room, filing paperwork and then doing X tool scenarios and then writing advice documents and then implementing advice. And so, like, I still to this day know how to do <laughs> all of that. Um, yep. And so often, sometimes from my own fault, if I've, well, I might have left a task to too late to be able to brief someone on how to do it, then I end up touching something like that that I shouldn't touch kind of thing. But... Okay. When that happens, we know that something's broken in our system or process that, like, it shouldn't it shouldn't come to that. So, yeah, there's definitely, I think there's further um, further ground that can be made in that area and further improvements. What do you think are the biggest mistakes that you, you've you seen from others that you've managed to overcome when it comes to being able to hand things off and, and get to the point where you go, I'm not doing that anymore? Um, 
It's a good question. What do you do? What do you do differently? That's the that's the yeah. point. And this is what actually I can tell you the one that I'm most recently grappling with, which I think is a big one, is um, the next part that we're focusing on is so if when we talk about advice production or at least strategy development moving into advice production, I'm mm. still quite involved in that in developing the strategy and documenting the reasons and, and all of that. And we and Walker Lane just recently hired a power planning manager to basically take all of that off the advisor's desk. And so that's something that I'm struggling with because you know I have a you know I like my advice and strategy to be a certain way. I like the document to look a certain way. I like I have a certain you know preference when it comes to selecting certain things. So all of all of which are completely teachable to someone else. But it's right. just the, the learning of trying to let go of that. But we've identified that in a week as a result of this hire, there's probably another anywhere between say four and eight hours of my time that I can get back if I can fully embrace that. Okay. So it sounds like focusing on the time you're going to get back is, is, a, is a starting point. Yeah. Okay. Motivation. So how did, like, what's something you have handed off that you look back and go, I didn't think I'd, I didn't think I'd be able to do that at the time. Um, so perhaps somewhat embarrassing, but until recently, like say a year or so ago, I would still do my own like risk researcher and wealth solver okay. scenarios, which again, is just, is purely the control freak that sits in me that I like to make sure that it's all right but stuff like that you know that's an instant an instant time time gainer okay um, uh what else how did you handle like let's, let's focus on like, how did you manage to hand that off and i mean obviously quelling the inner perfectionist must have been a part of it but how do you how did you manage to hand it off to the point where you were comfortable that you're not going to get involved in it um i think it just comes down to making sure that the people that are doing it have the have the appropriate training and support and guidance that you know, and, and letting them do it a couple of times and going to the effort of giving them the feedback so that once it comes back to you, it's correct. Whereas if it comes back to you and it's continually wrong, then the yep. default we've always found is, okay, it's just easier for me to do it rather than taking the time to, you know, go back and show them where it's done. But it's sort of, you know, it's that it's that old adage, like, you know, teach them, um, teach them, take the time to teach them once and it's just infinitely off your plate from there, there on. And do you do, when you're doing training, do you record it? Yeah, we use Loom videos. Okay, so you actually do, you don't get on and do on the job training. It's you record a video oh, showing well, a, a bit of both, but definitely for anything that's repeatable, um, we would do a, a Loom video. And I guess the latest thing that we've come across is that now we're, we're at the point now where we explain it to our team, and then we actually get them to do the Loom video for us. So we don't even, so I don't even need to do the Loom yeah, the video anymore. What do they say? The, the the best way to get someone to show you that they know someone is getting to teach it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um. Advice documentation and, and obviously the software plays a part in it. And you mentioned there's there's a lot of automation that comes from using managed accounts. There's a lot you're trying to remove. And it, it sounds like a lot of it's been about removing things from the process. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, removing things from the process, um, systemizing things as much as possible, using templates as much as possible, um, you know, getting as firm as you can on your house rules on certain things so that somebody else can actually effectively develop a strategy because they have the the guidelines and guardrails to follow ultimately yep we, like systemization is an interesting one like when you in your mind when, when a process is systematized what's actually happened what's actually happened uh what have you done to make uh, something because people go oh you need to systemize your business and that because that can be a really um non-specific you know right yeah so i guess well um in its in its uh most complete form it's a docu it's a documented written process with right. links to training videos or source or reference material or, or whatever it might be which we have for yeah. all of like the major things in our business like the review process the advice process the yeah. onboarding process the offboarding process um and then i guess there, and then in between that there's ad hoc stuff that might not necessarily warrant an entire advice document but you know it could even just be simple like you know having we that's, we use some real basic stuff like for our for our advice with for new business we just use an excel spreadsheet that we just track everything there and how long yeah. stuff we're looking for and, and and again that's probably our next focus to look at you know software that can do that a bit easier but i'm a big believer that um we come across advisors all the time that spend a lot of time like down in the weeds of like assessing software and figuring out their perfect tech stack and like you know yeah get really like they end up with like seven or eight different things and stuff but the reality is that we use x plan in our business and, and nothing else pretty much um and i just think that like 
it's very easy to get distracted. Like if you think about the amount of time you could spend on due diligence on new software or new ways yeah. of doing things. Um, I, I just, yeah, I wonder how much time should be spent on that versus just like X plan works, right? Like it does everything okay, but it's the only thing that does everything. Um, and, and, it, and it works for our purposes. So if I don't spend a lot of time out there, like looking at new software and stuff, but I guess, again, another benefit of, of our, of our licensee arrangement and sort of business partner setup is that there's a couple other people that do have a focus on that kind of stuff. So I can let them go and do the due diligence on something. And then I trust them if they come back and say, Hey, this thing is solving this issue, this issue of implementing our business. Yeah. So, yeah, cool. Like I don't need to go and do the same amount of research. If, if it's working for you, then let's roll it out for us too. And you got similar sort of businesses. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I just ask, so the, the business, I think you mentioned that the, the revenue, the number of clients in between the business as it was and as it is now has stayed roughly the same. For the uh, yeah, I think it's about, yeah, we probably, we went through, again, with you, a process of, as, as a lot of advice practices have, of, of sort of cutting off or, or um, disengaging with the, the tail of our business. Yeah. So we probably, in fact, actually, that's probably not quite right. So we probably, when I first took over, because I, I, I sort of never counted them as clients, really. So we probably had something like 220-odd clients um, at that time, and now we've got about 170. So we've probably cut off about... 50 well more than 50 because we've added we probably add let's say you know 12 to 20 new clients a year okay say. so the transition that happened has both been a one because you've got more efficient on the back office which is is has resulted you not having to have as many hands on on deck but also you've increased the revenue at the same time yeah and has that been has that been harder than you thought it would be or just um i still think um it's yeah yes is the answer to that like i think like i hear about um or know of firms out there that have like you know really big um new business figures and they've and generally it's come down to like you know they've got this perfect accounting relationship that just funnels all of their clients um you know to them and they're all pre pre-sold and it's just all sort of easy whereas for our business it's always been entirely organic client referrals has been where all of our works come from which has always been okay. strong but you know you and i've talked about this plenty of times before it's a bit frustrating yep. because you can't really control it like you can't turn it up or down depending on how how busy you are so you could have some quiet ones and then you have like at the moment we've got i think about like eight or nine clients in the pipeline that are all basically due for advice presentations in one hit which is not very not very manageable for systems and processes yeah. and capacity um but yeah I, I think definitely like new client acquisition is is one of the challenges of, of a lot of businesses i think it's probably going to get a bit easier with you know the number of advisors leaving the number that have left the industry and also i guess as the Australian population ages and as life gets more complex and more expensive, we're definitely seeing more inquiry and more people that are th giving thought sooner to their financial future. Yeah, there was a real burst. Of, it sort of began at the beginning of last year where suddenly a lot of people, a lot of people have just decided I want to retire and they're done. And it's, it's just, yeah, I mean, the, the, the financial landscape right now is all over the shop on various different levels. Um, legislation still pouring through left, right, and center. Let's. Um, I mean, I could keep talking about the business. I, I could, I'd, I'd love to challenge you a little bit on the, the lead flow, but I think we'll park that for the time being because it's not the first time we've had that conversation. But I'm. I'm I want to talk about the the Walker Lane thing because, yeah. as I said, I, I remember a while ago we had this conversation about. I think this can become a prevalent model. For those who don't know what the hell we're talking about, what is Walker Lane and how does it differ in your mind from? Let's call it a traditional licensee relationship. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, Walker Lane is our is our AFSL. Um, it was started by myself and a couple of other advisors back in that 2019. Basically, the first thing I did, or one of the first things after the final buyout, was leave financial wisdom and join Walker Lane straight away. Yep. Um, and I guess we yeah, the way that we view that we're different is that. Unlike a lot of licensee models out there, our 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 um, license and business was formed by advisors, and the major decision makers are advisors, people that have sat in front of clients, and they know the challenges that we face in terms of delivering advice, you know, developing advice, delivering it, implementing it, and all of that. I guess the the, the tedious slash time consuming part of our business, um, we all came together because we all have a very similar. We are all very similar. We're all sort of circa age 40 and our plan for the license is to basically grow up with other similar businesses all that have a growth mindset that are quite young and entrepreneurial. Um, yep. And I guess, yeah, the, the other main way that we sort of view ourselves as different is 
back to that that whole point of the advisors creating the licenses our plan is to basically be one brand and one business in due course with one set of processes with a combined back office and i guess with the the, the lens that we put over all of that is whatever we figure out is a is an issue in a, in advice practice say for example the advice um, production piece we'll go and solve yep. that for our businesses so as i said we've recently hired a power planning manager that again we sort of view as a, fo a force multiplier she'll still use an outsourced power planner for the advice generation but she'll do the strategy development the the bid related or well, if, if it still exists but you know the bid related documentation all of the justifications the research and all of that um i guess the other way potentially also that we view ourselves a bit different is whilst we offer the sort of standard you know do-it-yourself typical um dealer group model uh, we also offer a, what we're calling it a do-it-for-me model, so basically the ability to outsource your entire back office to us and you just focus on seeing clients. We probably Perfect. see it most valuable to like, well, uh, yeah, I guess most obviously to like accountants that are also advisors that don't necessarily want to, um, you know, have to worry about all that other stuff and just want to be able to see their clients. Um, but, yeah, as I said, I guess the biggest the biggest piece and the, or the, the biggest end goal for us is, uh, we're developing a professional partnership model whereby, you know, all of those like-minded businesses that look similar can come together ultimately okay. um, for the view of eventually, you know, an exit strategy at big business prices rather than small business prices. Okay. So, the, yeah. So, there's a, there is some degree of exit element to it at the end of it all. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask how it came about? Like, because... I, I don't imagine like as a bunch of people sitting in the pub and go, hey, let's start a licensee. There must be more, must yeah, be well, more actually, sort of, yeah. It's probably the one thing I can thank financial wisdom for actually um, because we we know each other from the peer, the peer group that we used to sit on. Okay. Uh, financial wisdom and just over a number of beers at different times, we'd always talked about, you know, what's next and where we saw things going. Some of the advisors had left and joined another dealer group. Um, and yeah, just after a couple of repeated conversations, it just, it started to come to light that we all sort of thought the same. Um, everybody ultimately wanted their own license. That was sort of the starting point. And then we had conversations around, you know, the, the, the effort involved in that and the ongoing costs and compliance and risk and everything. And then, yeah, just kind of by default made sense that why would all three of us go and get, you know, three separate licenses when we could just go get one and all sort of band together. So this came around because of because if people don't know financial wisdom, um, obviously you had to shut down. They just decided they didn't want to didn't want to be part of it anymore. So it was it, you, your hand was kind of forced a little bit. Yes, except I like to say that I literally gave my resignation one week before they announced that they were shutting down. Well, I would have gone Fair if it wasn't for the the historical nature of our old dealer group model and some shareholding in our business. I would have left them like years and years ago. But, so you would have worked with Kate, is that correct? Yeah, Kate. Yeah, Paul West, Pat Casey. Yeah, big shout out to Kate Americano, and of course, but yeah, Pat. That's right, he was there as well. I remember. Um, so, like, the obvious thing is, I think there were three businesses at the beginning. Is that correct? Yeah. And I, I know the characters, and I know um, everyone's got their own sort of take on things. Yeah. How do you like? How there must have been so many hurdles to actually getting it done. Like, you know, you're giving up control. Like, tell, how do you, yeah, so, how do you get past that? Yeah, inter interesting interesting comment every it, it, and it, i would say everyone has their own personality and style but once we actually got down to like the detail of it we realized that we were all pretty much aligned on all the key things and and most importantly we all realized pretty quickly that none of us were particularly strongly attached to our way of doing things and we all had the same common theme of a um, willingness to basically adopt best practices so if you know if josh had a system in his business that worked best or a way of accounting or, you know, something and, and it made sense, then we'd all happily adopt it. Like none of us are all, we all use the same similar sort of investment solution. We all provide a similar sort of advice side, different client types, but, you know, we all document our advice in the same way. And so there's, there was already a lot, a fair part of a fair amount of commonality there. But I think the key thing was that we weren't, that we were open to doing things differently. And even the practices that we've, um, that we've signed up since then, that's yeah. one of the key, the key, I guess, value alignments is that they're the same way. So they say to us, you know, just tell us what, tell us how to do this, tell us the best way to do this, and we'll just, we'll just adopt it and do it. Were there no, so there, nobody had any sacred cows? Mm, I don't think so. I think... Uh, so there's, there's nothing, you, you are happy to give, give, give up control or say, oh, don't worry, I won't keep this. And 
Yeah, well, so far, I guess, because we were quite common, there's actually been nothing really that I've had to give up. I guess the thing, right. I, had to give up, the thing that I wanted to give up, which was advice, documentation and preparation. So right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take, take that as fast as possible. So, um, um, well, that's really, like, and you've obviously brought businesses in. Have you had any situations? Because I've, I've worked with a lot of practices and I always, like, there's always one or two things where you work with a practice and they're, they're, they're really confident, not every practice, but there's a lot of practices that they, they, you look at the thing they've got and they, they, they're really, really proud of it. They, re they think it's amazing. Yeah. And, but you realize that either it's, it's not efficient or it's not yeah. as good as they think it is, or alternatively it's been superseded, but they just don't want to give it up. I mean, yeah. have, you, have you had so none of those yeah. We yeah. have had that, and as a result, we've actually, um, in our short, what are we now, three, four, four years of life, we've actually already exited two practices. Oh, now. wow. Okay. Because there was a misalignment there, um, and and we pretty quickly came to that realization. And so, yeah, basically said, ultimately, like, if you want to keep doing it this way, we're probably not the home for you, which they agreed, like they agreed. And so we went our separate ways ultimately. And again, okay. pretty strong on. I guess the things we learn from there is to get even stronger than we already are on making sure there's that cultural fit and really the key thing being that people aren't going to like dig in on really important things. Yeah, like our view is always like build the guardrails and then allow customization within it, but you've got to stay within the guardrails ultimately. Right. So I'm going to, I'm going to don't know the rules to, for success because I, th I actually think these are as relevant whether you're, you're, you're forming something like this or you're joining a licensee or even if you're just partnering with other business. I think there's some rules for success here. And one of them is you've got to be willing to kind of give up certain things to have a piece of the whole. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, how do you guys manage conflict? As in amongst us or like our conflicts register? <laughs> Sorry, no. What conflicts? No, I'm joking. Us, um, yeah. like, um, like, have you ever had a disagreement about something where you realize that, oh, okay. This, this yeah, is I'd say... Yeah, nothing, nothing major to date. But again, we just sort of all get in a room. Um, generally, you know, it might be it's often that one person has an opinion, and, and thankfully the other, the other few have the same different opinion. So it's easier that way, ultimately, as opposed to necessarily a bunch of completely disparate opinions. But generally, like as I said, we talk all the time. We get in a room together all the time, and if there's anything that doesn't make sense, we just sort of hash it out, put up our original sort of plan and the and the path that we're following on and, and sort of make the decision, pe pegging it back to that and seeing where it fits into where we said we wanted to go with all of this. That seems really simple. Like, that seems like, yeah, you just get in a room and hash it out. I mean, that's not going to work for everyone, is it? Probably not. And again, that's why. So we're not looking to your, to your earlier comment. You know, we're not looking to have 100 ARs. Like, our model is pretty much, yeah. you know, probably 10-ish professional partner partnership practices and maybe another 10 to 20 just licensed ARs. Um, yeah. And that's really all we need to achieve the scale and the numbers that we need to achieve the outcome that we're targeting. How many times have you said no? Like a percentage, you must be saying no more than you're saying yes. As into potential advisors? Yeah. yeah, definitely more no than yes. And where did you like... That must be it because obviously you've got a small practice and you're a small thing. And if you get big quickly, you get scale, but you're, you're saying no very actively. Is that hard to do or is it just you just get used no, to doing it's it? It's really, it's actually really because we are so clear on what we want it to look like. And I think because what we're looking for is, I wouldn't say it's niche, but it's definitely not common. Like even the, even the age and the, and the business stage in itself is wow. pretty, like, you know, most, most advisors out there are probably a good 10 plus years older than most of us, especially ones that own their own business. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's pretty it's pretty quick to figure out that it's a no. And it's not even necessarily you just need to say no, you just don't really, at the end of the day, it's generally the dealer group that's courting the advice practice and not always the other way around. So it's pretty easy just to not follow them up again, ultimately. So if you go through and you look at what the practice has to have or agree to, software must be something, it's like, if, if you're gonna come on board, we all use the same tools, software, correct? Uh, that, that's probably the one thing that gets the most discussion at the moment. So where we've landed at the moment is that advice production and compliance storage has to be an X plan. And then outside of that, we are more open to what you want to do. Like, so some of the practices use a standalone CRM system. Um, some practices use um, the astute wheel for their like projection um, and client engagement stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, the SOA is run out of the SOA wizard in X plan. 
and the files are stored and audited through XPlan. And if, simply because it's just, you've already got the templates and it works, is that right? Yep, yeah, the, we've got the template. It, it works for advice production is probably the thing that's strongest at. It's really just the CRM and workflow management and stuff that it's pretty average on, in my opinion. Um, so so when you look at the things that you're deliberately looking to share or leverage, Paraplane is obviously one of them. Software templates is another one. Training? Yep. Yeah, so like we run masterclasses and peer group days um, quarterly, um, which we encourage everyone to, well, which everyone does come to, but also people from outside our group are welcome to join as well. Um, the other parts that we're next focusing on uh, that we think is the part next part we can take off of businesses is advice implementation. Um, right. So we'll look to potentially have an admin resource in the license to do that part of it as well. Um, and obviously we're probably sort of hopefully holding out well for some good news come early in the new year when some of the stuff might wind back a bit in terms of some of the other compliance slash admin burdens in practices, a la the QAR stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah, ultimately, you know, the, the way that we view it or position is that we say if someone comes with a good idea or actually probably the other way around, if someone comes to us with a problem and someone else says that they've got the same problem, then we'll go out and find a way to solve that problem ultimately. And, and the power planning was the perfect example at our most recent, um, it, it had always been a, a plan for us, but at our most recent uh, peer group day, without fail, everyone around the room, we're talking, we always talk about challenges, wins and challenges at the start of the session and without fail, everyone's challenge was power planning and advice production. Wow. So I think within a month of that peer group, we've gone and hired someone to, to look to solve that problem for them. Just sim and I guess because there's, there's uh, so many of you um, attacking on multiple fronts, it's easier to, to kind of solve the problem. Yeah. What about, I mean, like um, the, the, the legal setup of this must have been quite significant, costly, yeah. and yeah. yeah. And that's probably probably one of our, and I talk to a couple of advisors all the time, they're like, oh, I'm just going to go get self-licensed. It's just easier. I can mm. just go and do my own thing and sit there. Like probably one of the things that we were most, not, not surprised we knew it was going to be the case, but one of the, the probably the most underestimated is the amount of money that we spend in legal fees, both for right. agreements, for setup stuff, for onboarding, offboarding people. Like it's just, yeah, that's it's it's a big it's a big number. Right, and you'd have to get it checked by everybody across all. Like you've got are you are you using the same lawyer or multiple lawyers? Uh, well, so we use we so Walker Lane uses two lawyers, one financial services expert and one contracts litigation expert right but then ultimately yeah each each of the individual partners uh well it's up to them really but if, if they want to get their documents reviewed by their lawyer then potentially yeah, there's like you know eight six to eight lawyers in the mix there yeah wow okay so you I, I imagine you have to be a bit more patient with things at times yeah i think depending on who you're dealing with some stuff goes really smoothly and some stuff can go really slow Right, okay. But I think but one I, of the things that we've done quite well is that we've, I guess, broken up the responsibilities quite clearly between people. So, like, in terms of the doing of it, um, like, say, like, the legal stuff, for example, Josh handles most of that, and so it doesn't take – until it's ready to be reviewed, it doesn't really take up anyone else's time. So we can kind of, like, ring fence it that way. A bit so you do, you do have kind of – I, I want to use fiefdom as a – I didn't want to use fiefdom as a word because you, you obviously have your own little sections, and, yeah. and that's kind of great up front. Yeah. And did that come about naturally or did you have to sit down and go, okay, yeah, my... Yeah, I think it did ultimately. Although mine, I think, was just default. I ended up as bloody RM and compliance expert, which <laughs> the most exciting job. But I think that was a, a function of the fact that I was the last out of financial wisdom, so probably had the most um, visibility into, like, how extreme the bid stuff could get. And so we've kind of yeah. taken, taken, like, the institutional grade level of that and try to then, you know, make it commercial but still keep a fair bit of the... The, the safety measures in place then. I saw Paul Barrett, I think it was an article, and he was talking about self-licensing as being um, about a number of different things, but one of the things it has to be about is you're willing to take ownership and responsibility for your interpretation of, of, of the compliance requirements. Yeah. Because a lot of the times that, I mean, I don't think, I don't think I'm surprising anyone to say that what comes out in terms of compliance is, is usually statements without not a lot of practical application and that fil normally traditionally it filters through licensing interpretation yeah nine times out of ten it gets a bunch of stuff added to it yeah does yeah. The, i mean does it keep you up at night to kind of interpret it and go that's what it might mean knowing that if you're wrong the you, you know 
you the potentially the, yeah, you've got to deal with it later on. Until you put it that way, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> no, I would say it keeps me up at night, but like there's definitely an element of that. But again, I think it's just about being smart in how you do things. So like we use, like we've got an independent chair on our mm-hmm. RCC. We use um, like an outsource compliance service for like questions and that kind of stuff. There's right. on there. Like we all have industry experience and, and some some more so than other like um so, you know some people were responsible for like building bid frameworks and stuff in large financial institutions and stuff so i think we've got enough of the capability around us to be confident that the decisions that we're making are the correct ones and i think so like at the same time again being advisors for advisors like we run a commercial view over things and maybe don't go quite as ridiculous as what yeah. you know a massive bank would have and when we like you know we still yeah, we we tick all we tick all the boxes. We meet all of the requirements. We've we, again we spent a lot of money on on um, legal fees, getting obligations registers all drafted up fully, and mapping all of our obligations requirements back to all of that. So we're we're pretty comfortable and confident that we're yeah. ticking all those boxes. Um, and then it's just a matter of so we we audit our advisors quarterly, just desktop based audits, um, which are much more of a, a coaching process than a you know punishment process. Um, and then now in particular, as we as we bring that advice production in-house, we believe it just adds us another layer of protection for the licence and something that we'll be going to our PI insurer for next round of renewals um, to basically, I guess, pull forward the case that we are less risky than our other yeah. two models out there. It's always struck me when I've when I, I seen a lot of self-licensed businesses of various shapes and sizes. I remember when I was at Hill Ross back in 2004, they, they actually assigned me to, to do an analysis and create a paper which was supposed to report back on why self-licensing was not a good idea, and I had to present to the the you know the, bo- the board of Hill Ross or the um, about the fact that the only reason why licensing wasn't a good idea it wasn't a financial model at all. It was basically a could you be bothered, and yeah. you know were you willing to own the risk? But it feels like to me there's a, there's a sweet spot where when a business is really really small and 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 going down that route. Potentially, there can be an underestimation of, of what's required to manage the client requirements. And then you kind of get to that scale where you, you, you're you nimble enough that you, you've got the resource or you've got enough resource in there to manage it. But you're also, you're not at that mindset that tends to come afterwards where suddenly you realize there's so many free radicals moving around the system and you've got to kind of try and control them and the fear sort of kicks in. And that's where there's, there's really interesting. And I've got a couple of businesses I work with are in that space and they're able to go, you know, the FSG doesn't need to be given here or blah, blah, blah. They can, they can kind of streamline the process without necessarily having that worry that um, they're, 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 they're exposed, if that makes sense. Yeah, agreed, totally. So, I mean, without going, I don't want to go into the, the financial side of it, but it feels to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, that there, we, to, to go into this kind of arrangement, there are certain things you need to add that, that you would not have if you're a single practice. But on the flip side, that gives you the ability to remove certain things or, or combine them. And it's yeah. that balancing out. That's that's where the formula is, right? Yeah, yeah. I think at the end of the day, obviously there's a cost to licensing, but we plan to deliver value on that from, I guess, the the the, the unseen stuff like the protection and compliance and the, the boring stuff that keeps you safe. But then ideally where we really want to partner with our practices and add huge values. So at the end of the day, as I said at the beginning in terms of our business, like the way you grow your practice is to be in front of a client to be delivering advice. And so if you yeah. can partner with a license that focus is take as much of off that as you as off for you as possible so that you can sit in front of as many clients as possible and deliver as much advice, then the upside is is pretty attractive in our in our view. Yeah. Makes total sense. Um I wanted to I want to understand a little bit about why you think I mean you must be aware that there's other businesses or other licenses that are popping up like you. Had quite a few meetings with a few of them recently, actually. Okay. So, yeah. And what's the similar sort of feeling you get about why they're popping up all of a sudden? Is it is it just a time and a place thing, or is there something I else think, going? On? Yeah, I think I think there's a few things. I think first and foremost, people are realising that it is actually quite technical and quite expensive to have AFSLs and deliver advice, and so um, scale scale or more scale past a single one or two man band practice kind of thing is yeah. absolutely critical. And I think also that they've, they've figured out that at the other end of it, too big is is too cumbersome and too too restrictive. So I think there's this sort of you know sweet spot in between it. Um, I think also not so much for us because of our age and what we're trying to achieve. But I think at the other end of the market, you know, there's a lot of advisors that are starting to approach or eye off retirement and so try to think of you know possible exit strategies. And and they've probably realised that again, being part of something bigger 
is um, is going to be more attractive and potentially open up more options than if you just try and go it alone ultimately. Um, yeah. And then I think the third thing is that there's just, yeah, the players in the market, like there's a fair bit of interest from like, you know, US private equity firms in the M&A space in Australian financial services. Um, you know, obviously you've got the, a, the AZ model, you've got uh, Merchant doing a deal just announced this week. So, yeah, I just think it's, it's probably just the natural progression of the industry, both from an ageing advisor demographic and just, yeah, the, the evolving of business models. Yeah, I can't help but feel, particularly with the Americans getting involved in the market, I know ANZ Energy have been doing it for a while, but they, they, they see something ahead that is, because um, I've always stayed out of the market because it's just, it's too complex, it's too, yeah. it's too difficult compared to, especially compared to the US market, which can tend to be a bit more of a, I don't want to call it the Wild West, but sometimes it feels like that. Yeah, well, I feel not that any of them have told me this directly, but I feel like potentially what's happening is that the US market is potentially becoming saturated with these plays and they've, and they've potentially deployed the capital they have to deploy there. And so now they've started looking out elsewhere and they've probably figured out that the Australian financial services market for, let's say it's probably at peak regulation, like it touch wood, but probably can't get any more <laughs> than it currently is now. Um, yeah. Peak, peak, peak regulation, um, the, the growing wealth base, the, the transition of wealth to another generation, yeah. like the renovation system, like all of these factors. I think uh, that the Australian dollar for them coming over here, like I think there's a number of factors that has just sort of come together to, wouldn't call it the perfect storm, but just to make it make it much more attractive or at least much more on their radar than it, than it once was. The only, the only thing that worries me, like absolutely, I think that's quite happening because they've not, they've not come over, well, they've tried to come in. I just the only thing that concerns me is if anything changes, American investors have a tendency to pull out of things very, very yeah. quickly. Yeah. And that's, that's the only thing that worries me. Hey, um, this has been, I could talk to you about this for hours. I do want to just sort of jump in. If if anybody is watching this later or listening to it on the podcast or even you know wants to understand more about the model or even have a discussion about how you did it and who it's for, what's the best way that they can sort of get in contact with you or get some information? Yeah, sure. I'm, yeah, obviously happy to happy. I love a coffee, love a lunch, so happy to to chat about any and I love business, so happy to chat to anyone and everyone about any facet of business. Um, yep financial planning business or, or AFSL business, uh, probably the easiest way to be on, on LinkedIn, Sam, Sam Carroll, which... Uh, Sam Carroll? There's too many out there. Oh. Add, add oh. there. I think there's only one, so... Is it Talum? I've always been calling it Talum. Jesus. Talum. Yeah, Talum. It's actually Latin for empower. Yeah, you've got to be careful of people who name their businesses after Latin names. It's a bad habit to get into. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'd, love, I'd love to see this done um, in the coaching space because I think it's got so many benefits but I also know that a lot of coaches would never allow it to happen for a whole bunch of reasons um, where, do you, where do you see sort of things going over the next um, few years in terms of obviously you guys have set yourself up and you must be expecting certain things to change people are kind of looking at, at the industry and going it's going to simplify banks are going to come back in what, what's your take on it yeah, I, I make the joke amongst our partners regularly that it'll be like the cba that probably buys us once they decide to get back into wealth management and realize what they're missing out but that somewhat facetiously but uh yeah i just think at the end of the day i see the industry i think that we're on the precipice of probably the best time to be a financial advisor um, yeah, I agree. 100%. The, as all the things we talked about today, you know, aging, aging population, increasing wealth, dropping numbers of advisors, potentially a, a, at least a calming down in regulation. Um, yeah, I think it's a, a good time to be an advisor. And you know, whilst we don't have a specific time frame as to what the future is, at the end of the day, every decision we make in our business is to develop a, as profitable a business as possible that is as attractive to end purchases as possible. I think if, if you as a business owner, as a, a, a practice owner, have endured the last five years, um, you've probably picked up a load of processes and systems in your business that are that are weighty. And But you, if you're still here, it means you've systematized it, you've managed to make it profitable, which means as, as the technology gets better and we strip out a lot of the complexity that doesn't serving anyone, suddenly you're in a situation where you've got an efficient business, you've got a lack of advisors in the industry, you've probably got a killer proposition because you're still here, and stuff like this where you can leverage this to to create efficiency and ultimately eliminate certain things so you can get back to what you're doing. You're 100%. I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's It's. slowly looking more and more downhill it goes, which is why investors are coming into the market. It's, it's, it's mm. a phenomenal time to be in, in it. If you're, still, if you're still not, if you're not burnt out and you still manage it, you should be good. Um, man, this has been incredibly useful. Yeah, um, what I would love to get 
if you could, uh, I know Margaret said off, Greg, Josh, Martin, and Adelia, would you just pop in the chat box the na main thing that you've taken from today that you think has been most valuable or useful or or you, you felt like, you, you know, you wanted to you'd implement in your business or definitely look out. That would be really helpful. I know I like to get feedback on this stuff. Sam, in the meantime, while I'm getting that feedback, if you were to go back and go on this journey again of um, changing the business fundamentally, changing the profit model, um, really getting clear about what you wanted to do, what are the three things that, or someone else is, is at the, is looking at this and going, I want to do that. What are the three most important things that you think you would do, focus on, implement, or avoid? in order to, to get there sooner or easier or whatever it might be? That's a good question. Um, I would say act faster. Okay. Yeah, I would say, and, and they're probably all led to the same thing. I would say act faster, push harder for the answers that you want. Like don't take no as the answer. Um, yep. And just, um, yeah, don't hold on to any like old ways of doing things or any preconceived notions that you can't do something just because it's not how it was done previously okay so limiting beliefs i yeah. love it cool um greg says some of the trenches realities the outlook ahead for the industry and the implication of us investors coming to the market me too i like having this discussion because um i think that's one of the things that you kind of notice when you if you don't talk about it, you don't. It, it, it's not as obvious as it is. Uh, Martin, love your clarity and how it allows you to say no to the wrong opportunities. That is something you've always been really good at. I mean, I like. There's a George Bernard Shaw quote I like, which is, "The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man adapts the world to suit uh, to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man." I love it. Do you want to know the one that I like that um, that you always say to me, which actually has caused me a lot of um, heartache over the over the years? You always say to me, if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. Yeah, if it's yeah, not a hell yes, it's a hell I'm like, oh, fuck. It's, it's, oh, sorry. It's, I'm like, oh, it's not a hell yes. This is so, I, I need it to be a yes, but it's not a hell yes. So Deep down, I think if you actually get back to it, you know if it's a no. Mm. Um, I absolutely agree. Greg, getting back some time is such an important moment. It is, right? When you can see at the end of it, I do the role audit thing, as you know, and, and when you put in front of it, so if you give up these seven things, you'll get 10, 15 hours back in your week. That's the motivation. Otherwise, there's no really reason to do it. Um, Adila, interesting to hear Sam say that the pod model is unprofitable mm, and good to hear his path to self-licensing and also the future of the industry. Sam, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Any Thank final you. thought, Jerry Springer? Um, maybe just I'll, I'll just, I'll just um, comment on, on Adelia's comment. So the pod model, I think, is unprofitable unless you have very, very um, high fee-paying clients. That's fair. Like very high fee, like 30 to 40K plus. Then it works. Yeah, I agree. Like I do the pricing on it and you, it's, you're doubling your costs and at least – at least 30 to 40% of, of, of the process you're doubling up, which if you're pricing it, I mean, a lot of people go, yeah, but the efficiency is off the back of it. I was like, yeah, but you can kind of get the same efficiency. Yeah, but in audio. Enough, you can get that with offshore resources. You can get that. You can, with just audio, audio summaries, video. You can do the same thing without having to have two. And let's be honest, if you've got an associate, they're probably sat in the room most of the time doing yeah, on autopilot most of the time anyway. Anyway, yep. agreed. To the day. Mate, enjoy Melbourne. Uh, Josh missed the first session. It'll be looking out for the recording. It'll be on YouTube first. It'll be on our private portal if you sign up for that almost immediately. Um, the free portal, sorry, I should say. And it'll be on the podcast, I think, probably maybe two to three weeks. Jen will probably be more specific around that. Mate, enjoy Melbourne. Thank I hope you. you get, I hope you get, okay, remember, nice. if anybody's got a ticket, please hit it up. Yeah. Um, I hope you get in the stadium. Um, I hope you get the result you wanted. And, uh, mate, I'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, Steve. Catch you later. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. See ya.